I have long taught that if anyone is to live close to the Lord, but especially do the work of a teacher of truth, to be a gospel preacher, then one should not stay very long away from the prophets of the Old Testament. When you study the times in which they lived and what God called them to do and the state of the people of God, at least they should have been the people of God, at the time that they did their work, it is uh, something that stands out teaching us about prophets or preachers or teachers who are saying things people do not want to hear. Now we like to think that when people who properly understand what the Bible is and the message of Christ is, that when they understand that, that they will gladly receive with meekness, as James says, the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save their soul. But that's just not always the case. We must remember that in reading through the prophets, as we talk about the, that section of the Old Testament, major prophets, minor prophets, major prophets, the books are longer, minor prophets, the books are brief than the major, that when they did their work, they were under great peril usually. And yet they still did their work faithfully. They said to people what those people did not want to hear, but the people needed it to hear. They needed to hear it. And we need to then reflect upon our own lives. All of us. No matter how long you've been in the church. To make sure that we are following the whole counsel of God. I would ask you then to turn with me to Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. We won't go into a lot of the background of Amos as to when... He came to do the will of God, but simply to say that he came to Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, not long before it was to fall to the Assyrians and never exist again. He was one who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah. He was not an, quote, formally educated prophet. He was someone who lived about 12 miles to the southeast, east of Jerusalem. He was a shepherd and he was what's called a keeper of sycamine trees. And the, whole, and the New King James is going to say sycamore, but not like our sycamore trees here. It's like a very large shade tree that bears fruit like a fig. And um, when it says he was a keeper of those trees, they basically had to pinch the end of the fruit or poke a hole in it to make it go ahead and ripen. And I've often thought about that, climbing all over a tree, pinching each one of, the t of those things. They used a lot of that food to feed animals with. So he, he was a farmer of sorts. He was a person of agriculture. He was not someone that was, I said earlier, trained to be a prophet. But he's the one God chose. He's the one that was chosen by God because God knew he could do the work that needed to be done. It's a great lesson in all of that. But we want to note in these verses I've given you, chapter 7 of Amos, verses 1 through 9, that God is bringing, or did bring, to him a vision of terrible destruction. And it's the destruction by the Assyrians of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, on Wednesday night, because we're studying Deuteronomy and reading about the law and its details, I pointed you to the 17th chapter of 2 Kings, which tells you about the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. The reason we did that then was because you're reading Moses before they go into the land of Canaan, that is, the children of Israel go into the land of Canaan, telling them you must do what God said. And it's repeated over and over again, about every way you could think to repeat it, that you must be obedient. Over and over again, he tells them, if you're not obedient, God will drive you off of this land just like he's using you to drive these other people off the land. Over and over again, keep my law, keep my statutes, obey my will, you must do this. And it's just said over and over, repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. 
And then we turn over and see in 2 Kings, lo and behold, everything they said they would do and they were told to do and they must do for God to bless them, they didn't. Many, many years passed in which God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. But they didn't change. Now when you read down through these first few verses of Amos chapter 7, you see some apocalyptic language, that is some very symbolic language, which was used by the prophets when they were saying there's a great upheaval, and that upheaval is coming because God brings it. But then when you come down to about the seventh verse, you see some pretty plain language. And so we read, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, which are with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Which implies he had been overlooking, overlooking, overlooking in the sense of giving them time to repent when the prophets were sent to them. But they didn't. So he says that's at an end. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And of course you remember at the beginning of the northern kingdom. It was because Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was determined to be so hard on the people. And he wouldn't relax anything. That then these ten northern tribes pulled off, set their own kingdom up. And Jeroboam, who had been driven out of the kingdom by Solomon, had gone to Egypt when he thought things were working in his favor, came back and became the king over the northern kingdom, the first king. And uh, he didn't mind uh, corrupting the law of Moses. So he set up calves in Dan and Bethel. And so he couldn't afford to have these people going back down to Judah. That would tend to pull them back into Judah. So he said, now here's your gods. And he put priests there and Always when you read of Jeroboam, it'll be something like this. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And that began to start the whole history of Israel. It went from bad to worse and much worse. And now the prophet says, God's had it with you. He's given you ample opportunity, more than ample opportunity. He's begged, he's pleaded, and you wouldn't change. And so... Israel had failed to measure up. That's the idea of the plumb line. Failed to measure up to God's standard. They were no longer, if you please, in the straight and narrow of what the law of Moses told them to do and how to live. They were no longer true. They were like a leaning wall. Because the plumb line keeps the wall straight as you measure and build it. A leaning wall ready to collapse. And this was all because of their persistent idolatry and all manner of immoral sins that went along with that. And you had a priest, Amaziah, a priest of the idols, who was very opposed to what Amos had to say. Look in verses uh, 10 through 13 of this same chapter. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jer Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Well, Amos was teaching the truth, or he wasn't. Being a prophet sent from God, he told them exactly what they needed to hear, but what they did not want to hear. Verse 11, For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. That just can't be. It's just not right. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more Bethel, for it's the king's chapel, and it's the king's court. He almost Hear Amos say, so what? That didn't mean anything to a godly person who wanted to keep the law and be faithful to God under the law. But it meant something to the people who had been corrupted and who had the ideas of the way the world functions and how the world measures greatness. 
So you can see the kind of character Amaziah was. He accuses, when you read this, he's accusing Amos of being disloyal. He basically says the people can't stand listening to you anymore. And he thinks Amos would be a whole lot better off if he went back home. In other words, we don't want your kind here. And thus he was forbidden to speak in Bethel because it was the very seat of government. Well, speaking today, if ever there was a place that needed the Word of God in its fullness preached, it's at every seat of government in every state and county, city, and the United States itself. Well, you can see the kind of person that Amos was, a fearless person, a man of great faith in God, a man who only acted by the authority of God. But he was certainly saying things the people did not want to hear. The life of a prophet was not an easy one because the message that they had to offer many times was unpleasant. If ever anyone could be called negative, I think it would be just about any prophet. Go read Jeremiah and uh, you get the idea that every day he lived, he was out of sorts with everybody. But he wasn't. He just taught the people what they had to know they didn't want to hear in order for them to be ready for the time to come. If you look in verses 11 and 12, you'll, you'll see that Amos wasn't the, the only one. Uh, David complained that his words were distorted. List to what is said by David in Psalm 56, verses 5 and 6. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Now it was Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2 on that first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ when the Lord established His church that declared that David was a prophet. Sometimes we don't think of him as that, but the Holy Spirit by Peter said that he was. And he knew then, when he stood for the truth and spoke the truth, that even the king of Israel, he suffered through a great deal. You should study more about David when he was running from Saul and when he was trying to be uh, the king and how he tried to, in wisdom, do those things. And then later, when Absalom rebelled and David had to leave home and leave with those faithful to him and run from Jerusalem, well, Jeremiah once wanted to quit, and I think probably at one point or the other, the prophets faithful to God under the great burden they bore from persecution had those thoughts cross their mind. I do not know of all that the Bible defines faithfulness to be. A faithful gospel preacher or anyone faithful in the church who at one time or the other didn't raise the question in their mind, do I really want to keep going through this? And of course, if you answer as you ought to answer, uh, yes, you do, because it's the right way. It's the way of God. In Jeremiah 27 through 10, that great prophet, the weeping prophet of Israel, weeping over their sins and the consequences of their sins, said, O Lord, Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not mention him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of forbearing, and I could not stay. Now stop and consider that for a minute. What is the prophet saying? There's something that was greater than all of the misery he was going through for speaking the truth to the people when the people didn't want to hear it. He's simply saying, I knew what was right, I know what's right, I know what's wrong, and I cannot be quiet about what's wrong without speaking the truth about it. You get some of that idea when Paul came to Athens and he was waiting on his party to come there. 
And he was so disturbed and upset in spirit over all the idolatry that was there. Same kind of thing. He couldn't be quiet. Woe be to the member of the church who's learned to be quiet over evil in their own lives, their families' lives, or in anywhere. He said, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, Peradventure, he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. To one extent or the other, at one time or another, every faithful member of the church, every faithful child of God, regardless of what age and which they live and they've all gone through this it's a trying time and so it was meant to be for we must make those decisions and without decisions how do we grow how do we develop how do we become more like Christ how do we see things as God sees them and therefore be blind to them as men see them how do we stop those things we stay true to the book no matter what People will assign their problems, now you get this, people will assign their problems to the bearer of bad news. Make a difference how true that news is. It's bad because it usually condemns their actions and their beliefs. But nevertheless, the preacher of truth who exposes error in people's lives are said to be the problem. It's always amazed me. But it's true. Ahab accused Elijah of stirring up trouble. 1 Kings 18, verses 17 through 18, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? I don't think there's ever been a faithful gospel preacher who didn't have somebody come up and in one form or fashion ask him that very, that very question. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. But thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. People simply wanted the good prophet Jeremiah dead. Jeremiah 26, 8 through 11, the scripture reads, And it came to pass, and Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people. Now, you'd think the people of God would enjoy that, would like that. But what prophets like that? But we read on that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, of all places. Can you imagine today, people opposed to the godly man of Jeremiah, and where were they opposed to him? In the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, when they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes, and to all the people, saying, This man's worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Making difference whether he told truth or not, that doesn't even into it. He's against us, though he's wrong. Well, is he teaching you the truth? Is it the truth of God's word? Well, he just preaches against us. He ought to die. It's amazing what people do to themselves. In John 19 and verse 12, Jesus Christ himself was accused of treason. And then in Acts 17, twice, 16 through, or 6 through 7 and chapter 24, 5, he's described as turning the world upside down by the message he preached. What does that tell you about those people living so far away from the truth of God or so contrary to the truth of God that when they hear the truth of God, they think it's turned everything upside down when really it's turning it right side up. When we get so in love with sin and with false doctrine that condones our sins, the truth begins to sound strange to us. And the further get it, please, that this nation begins to move away from the truth. The more the pure, primitive, pure gospel of Christ, the word of God will seem very strange to them, and it will seem hateful and evil 
even it does to some in the Lord's church who have chosen to go contrary to the authoritative word of God. Well, what did the prophets do? And this is where their own personal faith in God based on His word shone out very clearly. They had to tough it out. Some people want some sort of Harry Potter magic wand. It's bad and it's evil, but you just float around and nothing ever bothers you. You speak the truth that condemns sinners and you speak it plainly and right to them, but you're sort of over here floating around in some sort of ethereal bubble and nobody can get to you. No, they had to tough it out. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7 talks about his face being set like a flint. Now, why would he say that about that man? Why is that needful in the Word of God to say about him? Because he had to just tough his way through it. When you know what's right because God gave you the brains to know it and you study it, you read it, and you know it, then you keep it. But they may oppose you. They may this. They may that. Well, you still keep it. But they may this and may they do. You still do what you know the book said. Yeah, but the whole bunch of folks who claim to be very pious people are opposed to it. You still do what the book said. That way. And you need to set your face like flint when that time comes. Jeremiah 1, 17 through 19 you learned that that great prophet needed to watch it fortify himself. And only he could do that. The scripture reads, Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For, behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee. Listen. But they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. If you're going to ever be a teacher of truth, teach the whole counsel of God, and say to people what they need to hear, even when they want to hear it, you better have that kind of faith in God and the Word of God. I like what Brother G.K. Wallace said. The fellow told him one time, he said, I'm tired of hearing that. And he said, yeah, but you're not through hearing it. Now that's exactly how you have to be in your own personal life and service to God, in your family's life. And in your life serving God wherever you are, but especially when it comes to being a faithful preacher of the gospel and defender of the faith. Ezekiel had it tough. And I use the word tough. That's really putting it mildly what these prophets went through for the cause of the Lord. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not. Neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. You know what that's saying? Just walk right up like David did. Look them in the eye and say what they need to hear. Most of the time, people won't do that, so they're absolutely amazed. Do like a preacher did one time when he was preaching. The guy got up and walked out, and as he started down the aisle, he told him to come back and sit down. He wasn't through with him. Well, that's rude. That's so unloving. You mean tell me Jeremiah was rude and unloving? Ezekiel was rude and unloving? Ezekiel didn't care for these people? Amos did not give a whit about them? Uh, maybe we better go back and look at our view of love and care and all that kind of thing. It was easy for the church to be embarrassed about the message of Christ because the cross was a shameful thing. And the pagan who knew enough about the founder of the Christian religion, we say, to know that he died on the cross did not let the Christians forget that. I think I told you one time that on my trip years ago over there, I, was, I think it was in Rome, and here was a picture of a crucified person drawn on the wall, but he had a donkey's head. Now what were they saying? That graffiti of long ago. They were laughing at the Christians. 
for following somebody as God who was crucified. That's how shameful it was. Long before the days that a cross became an ornament. Today, I think probably we might get the idea a little bit if we wore an electric chair emblem around our neck. My God died the electric chair. You see, it was a shameful thing. But we've lived too much when so, such has been countenanced, that is, Christianity has been, and we don't think of it as that. That's why Paul declared, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's why the apostle Peter could say in 1 Peter 4, 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in this name. If we had to go out today and when people found out we were Christians, they made light of us, they put us down, they mocked us. I tell you, there'd be a lot of members of the church find out they didn't want to be known as Christians. The purpose was to place focus on the message and not the messenger. That is, that's what the preacher was to do. The treasure of God doesn't always come then in bright packages. Amos was a herdsman, as I said earlier. He did those things. Simple person. By what right do you have to come up here, just no redneck, tell us all these things in the capital before the king? Moses uh, evidently had some sort of impediment or difficulty in speaking. It probably wasn't nearly as bad as he let on when he tried to use it for an excuse. But he had something there he felt like he could fall back on, Exodus 4.10. And then look at the apostles themselves, all except the apostle Paul were not highly educated men. None of them were educated according to the formal education of the day. But the purpose was to declare the message and not focus on the man. Well, why bring all this up? Folks, people do not want to hear rebukes. They do not want to hear it. Yet when you read 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul charged that young man, Timothy, to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, and reprove, rebuke, reprove, rebuke. Isn't that something? Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I want to ask you something. When you teach the word of God in a classroom or from the pulpit at a home Bible study, how can you teach the Word of God without either reproving, rebuking, or exhorting? I want to see somebody show me how you do that. That's the only way to do it. There is no other way to do it. When James Robinson, some years ago, an avowed and openly homosexual man, was made a bishop in the Episcopal Church, in that same church, the Archbishop of Nigeria denounced the appointment. And here's what the Archbishop in the Episcopal Church of Nigeria said about him. It would be an abomination for this man to be an appointed bishop. And that's right in anything. But here's his response. That is Robinson's response. I'm not surprised or angry about what the Bishop of Nigeria said. I don't doubt his sincerity or faith to our Lord. In fact, he's being true to his own journey to God. So am I. I don't know if any of us can do any more than that. I have no doubt that we can believe exactly opposite things, each walking our faithful journey with God, for our walk is imperfect. My hope is that somehow we can keep coming to the communion rail together until we get it figured out. I am going to continue coming to the communion rail, and I hope that the primate of Nigeria would come as well. Now there is the corrupted mind, an example. I could not give you a better one. Anything goes just as long as you're sincere in it. God will accept it. What a response. And yet if we don't watch out in certain areas, while we may not go that far right now, we can in various other areas of our life that's contrary to the will of God say, well, that's, that's not so bad. 
but we might point a finger at somebody else saying, that's real bad. And then we can adopt this, quote, ecumenical view that says, well, we're all doing our best. I'm sure we're all imperfect. And we need to be bound together by love knowing we're all imperfect. And learn to tolerate one another. And everybody's doing their best. I don't want to impugn so-and-so's motives. And don't we all love one another? And we just keep on keeping on. Now that's the message of today. You've heard it over and over again. Nobody says what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. They just don't. How deceived we can be. This man claimed that people can believe exactly opposite things and still be faithful to God. He's so much like Israel in the days of the judges. This is said more than once, but in Judges 21, 25, there was no king in Israel in those days. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's always been a problem. Always will be a problem. Well, consider what the Apostle Paul had to say to the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness but ye have not so learned Christ now that is up to date and relevant and fresh as the morning newscast in Canada, as you know, and it gets more that way now, the courts have ruled that speaking against homosexuality is hate speech. It's forbidden. And by the way, in the church, you don't have to have a ruling from Washington or Austin or somewhere. It's just about got to be this way. Don't you speak on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Don't you explain Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 dealing with that. And the reason why it's got too many people in too many places that are living in adulterous unions. Don't you do what John the Baptist said uh, to Herod when he said, the woman you're married to, remember they were already married, as the world says marriage, but he says it's not lawful for thee to have her. And he still called her your brother Philip's wife. Well, no, she's Herod's wife. No, she's your brother Philip's wife, to make what the law says, because they were the ones that were joined together by God. And we can't stand up and declare what John declared. It is not lawful in America. It can't be civil law he's talking about. King is a civil law. It has to be the law of God that condemned that marriage and made it no marriage. And so we still must speak what the people don't want to hear when it's the truth of God. Sin is still sin. I've said it over and over again. You know it. The only thing that makes God upset with man and separates man from him is the transgressing of his law. Sin, verse John 3, 4. Nothing else. You may not like the way somebody does this or does that, but if it does not transgress God's law, God doesn't care. Then that comes as a surprise to folks. He doesn't care necessarily about what you like or don't like. But he cares more than we can possibly ever understand about somebody disobeying his will. Now consider what you've got in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at what the power of the gospel or how powerful the gospel actually is to people who honestly receive it and believe it. Paul reminds the Corinthians of what some of them had been before they heard believed the gospel and obeyed it. Beginning in verse 9, Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuse themselves, mankind, and that's covering, covering all sorts of homosexuality. 
nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, who am I to say then? They will. When the Holy Spirit inspired word of God by an apostle to the Lord's church in the first century said they won't. If they won't, they won't. Well, I don't like that. You just have to look for another place to preach. Fine, I'll go preach it there. But I'm going to change the message. And when members today try to find a congregation that's faithful in all things, they find that harder and harder to do. Because people are beginning to be like Judah and Israel before then. They're loosening up in all sorts of areas. The authority of the Word of God means nothing. And when you point out to them, didn't the Bible say this? But here you are doing something opposite. Yeah, yeah, but that just blah, blah, blah. They explain it away. Verse 11 says of this list here, and such were, were is past tense, used to be. It's not practiced anymore. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name by the authority of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now what does that say? The gospel came to them. How did they know any of these things were sin if it was not condemned outright by the preaching of the gospel? As I said, you can't preach the gospel without reproving, rebuking, exhorting. You can't do it. If you're trying to do that, you're in sin yourself. The Bible overall and the New Testament in particular was meant to expose sin in people's lives and show them that God's provided a way for the forgiveness of those sins and to take you to glory if you're faithful to the cause. When Jesus told us to be lights, remember light contradicts darkness. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Adam, that ties into your lesson last week or last Wednesday. There's no way you can have a light and have darkness and all of it meld together. Light dispels darkness. Light cannot exist with darkness. That's why the gospel is called light and the works of the world darkness. And that demands that when we preach the truth, we rebuke every dark sin that's there. This is why the world rejected Jesus. Just read John 1, verses 4 through 5. He came to his own, his own received him not. Why? Because he was the light. And the light shining on us. The truth was exposing people in their ungodliness. They didn't like it. Too often we're timid, too timid to tell people that they're living sinful lives or they're engaged in any one sin. Who then is hiding the light of God when we do that kind of thing? In Ephesians 5, 11 through 17, the scripture reads, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now tell me how much fellowship can you have with the unfruitful works of darkness? Paul said none. What does he say you're supposed to do then as a child of light? Reprove them, show they're wrong, and show them the right way. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. That describes a whole lot of what's going on in the United States today. We notice, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The righteous will always contend with the wicked. Proverbs 28, 4 reads, They that forsake the law praise the wicked. But such as keep the law, contend with them. Do you know that was in your Bible? What does that say about being faithful to God in the church? You can't be quiet against evil. If people who, people who are quiet and who are accepting it, uh, they've forsaken the Lord. That's why they praise the wicked. But such as keep the law, you'll contend with them. No wonder Jude would say contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude 3. We must rejoice in standing for the truth, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. There was a time in the churches of Christ when you went back to the time of the 20th century early on and back in the 19th century, you know, people, you know, that, that, that's a bottle of water. Well, no, I think it's a snow cone. No, it's a bottle of water. Well, I, I, I want it to be a snow cone. I'm sorry, it's a bottle of water. Yeah, but I, I'm looking for a snow cone. I'd like to think that's a snow cone. Well, you can think all you want to think, but if you think right, you'll know it's a bottle of water. 
Now you say, well, you mean that's the way you're supposed to preach? Well, how else would you preach it? Here's a snow cone, folks. Now, when I do that and you thought I really meant that, you'd probably think I didn't need to stand here anymore. But preachers do that all the day long, receive big money for it. When it comes to spiritual matters, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Peter said that, that baptism does also now save us, 1 Peter 3.21. No, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Well, just take that and go right on down the line with all sorts of other doctrines and tell me a doctrine of Christ that has not been perverted. You don't have to observe the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week. You don't have to sing and sing only in the worship of God in music. So on and so you go. Well, that's a snow cone and all the others, right? Whatever happened, by the way, we'll close with this. Whatever happened to Amaziah, who was so bold in opposing God's people, God's prophet in particular, well, look at verses 16 and 17 of Amos chapter 7. And the scripture reads, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Listen, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall, fail, shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line. And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of this land. David Brown 2.38, now put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. You can stand here and oppose the truth I'm preaching all day long because you don't want to hear it. Now you want to hear a little more? Here's what's going to happen to you personally. And it's not a very good message. Somebody rose up and told you that. Would you be happy? Your wife is going to be a harlot in the land. I might get somebody's ears turned red. That's exactly what he said because that's what was going to happen because God said so and he brought it about. Now why? Because they sinned against God and would not stand the truth dealing with their lives. We don't want to be in the shoes of Amaziah or anybody else. He claims to be a servant of God and a spiritual person, but does not want to hear the whole counsel of God. We are the people, as the church of Christ and all the Bible defines that to mean, who have stood for the truth. Listen, the truth brought us into existence. If we stop standing for the whole counsel of God, we deserve to go out of existence. Because we'll just become another man-made institution. How do you become a man-made institution? Set aside the will of God and do as you please. It's that simple. Of course, deceive yourself that you're, and make yourself think that you're still performing the Word of God, but you're not. Individually, you need to look into your life and ask, what is my attitude toward the Word of God? Collectively, as the church, how much we need to do that. So we bring the lesson to a close about speaking things people don't want to hear. And we must conclude that the safe way is to live a righteous life personally, that's going to involve some self-examination, honestly doing so, some repentance, some change, some examination that shows the truth in our lives, and then to work with one another. You know, part of fellowship is that each one of us together keeps the other one straight. I don't think we see that. We don't realize that if you see me doing something, part of your fellowship with me and that we're brothers and sisters of the Lord, you'd come to me and say, David, do you, do you think you ought to be doing that? Here's what the Bible says. We are so sold on Amaziah's view of things, we'd get offended if somebody came and said that. We shouldn't. We should receive with meekness the engrafted word. If you're not a Christian, there's only one way to become one. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're a child of God and you've sinned in some way, especially your sins brought reproach on the church because you committed it publicly, then you need to repent of that sin, come confessing it. We'll pray with you and for you, and God will hear and forgive. Now, in all honesty, if there's anyone here who's subject to the gospel call, will you not heed the words of this message and then listen to the words of the song? Let it motivate you to act upon what you know is right, and then do what's right, and you'll be what God wants you to be. Why not do that now while we stand and sing?